a lot of people I've spoken to have said how much they absolutely loved Palestine. Yeah. Oh, and also how they missed the excitement once they were home. Oh, yes, yes. You know, the, yeah. Yeah, it was never the same again. No, no, it wasn't. No, I, I loved it. It's a lovely country. It got mm. a bit hot mm. in the summer. And you, by the end, of, we used to wear a khaki drill, which was a tropical kit, right up until November. Mm. Which, when that bomb went off, we were wearing khaki drill then, I can remember. Mm. Uh, shorts and shirt, and the day temperature would still be the same. Still be the same. Mm. And uh, in midsummer, of course, it was in the 90s, yeah. humid. Yeah. You put your um, shirt on in the morning, and then by 10 o'clock, it was soaking wet. Yeah. Yeah. Did you get the chance to see anything of Jerusalem? Oh, yes, I did. Mean, sort of yeah, we went on a sightseeing trip. We went on a tour of Jerusalem and, and Bethlehem. Mm. Uh, it was part of the. Um, Army curriculum, you might say, for the uh, yeah. um, the troops, and we went to all the uh, places. But the the guides who took us were always careful to say this is where such and such incident was supposed to have taken place. Was believed to have taken place. Mm. Yeah, quite. And uh, we went to Gethsemane and Church of the Holy Sepulchre and all those places. You see, I wasn't particularly impressed, but then um, we were in the Bethlehem mm. and. Uh, where the manger was supposed to have been, you know. Mm. You know but then we went through the moment. It was, it was, yeah. I liked the old city best. It was real Arabian night stuff. You know, yeah. Very nice, very nice. Yeah. All the stalls there with the Arabs and the Sunday yeah. wares, you know. Yeah. That's great. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Were you there? Did you go there? I, I have been a few times, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yes, it's, it, yeah. it is good. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I suppose in amongst all this, you didn't have much time for romance. There weren't any women in the camp, I can tell you that. And those, um, when they stopped us going out, I mean, there wasn't a chance to, mm. there wasn't a chance yeah. to get involved in anything like that, you know. Um, when we went to Egypt, some no ATS they, yes, or anybody. No, they sent most of them home. Mm. Got rid of them. Um, uh, RAF WAFs at the RAF station, but they all went early once the once the situation got serious. Yeah. Then they sent them packed their back to all home. Mm. See, yeah, it would have been if any of those had got killed there. Yes. No yeah, no turn that. Elder soldiers back on them. Yeah. Was I was talking to someone who'd been in the Western Desert and got leave to Alexandria mm. and had a fortnight there because I think he'd been hurt as well and had a great time, but he wouldn't tell me what sort of a great time he'd had. Well, you don't, do you? Well, I suppose uh, not. No, but I no. gather Alexandria was quite a spot. Just generally. I never went to Alexandria. I was only in the Canal Zone. Right, yeah. I never got beyond that. Yeah. Um, and I Cairo, think. too. I mean, Cairo, seems to I never went there either. Quite um, a place. Uh, in a kind of decadent way. Well, well there's, there's, decadence, there's decadence yeah. everywhere, Peter. Yeah, but during the war, a lot of people just, they just seem to have had a whale of a time in Cairo. You know, I think if you were sort of in the upper uh, echelons of society. A lot of men came back fantastic. from the war and they were homesick for the war after a few yeah. months. God, I wish the war yeah, was still yeah, on those days. They had a lovely time. Cairo was a good spot. I remember uh, when we never had any fruit during the war, no oranges. No grapes because they stopped all that. Mm -hmm. In Palestine, of course, they well they literally grow on trees, but it, it's orange country, and um, they pick them when they're green, just after Christmas, and then they get right on the way to where they're going. And we had this uh, system where we could buy these baskets, and each one would contain about sixteen Jaffa oranges. Mm. And they would sew the top up with a linen, put your dress on. And I sent two baskets home to England, and they got there too. Mm. They arrived there, right. Yeah. And uh, my mother tells me that when they arrived, they couldn't believe it because they hadn't seen oranges for six years, you see. And they were there, all these lovely jack oranges. Yeah. And uh, quite an I, event. I think the neighbours got one or two each, you know, and apparently. Mm. <coughs> but we, <coughs> when we, when we first got to Egypt, off the boat, we got on the train at Port Said and they trained us up to Tel El Kabir. And as I said earlier, the army always times you so you arrive in the middle of the night, you see, uh, that's one of those traditions. Mm -hmm. And we arrived about three or four in the morning. And 
there was a meal waiting for us in the, tent of, uh, in, in the uh, cookhouse, lovely meal it was, and um, we were hungry. And the pudding, or duff as they call it in the army, fresh orange segments with sort of um, evaporated milk type stuff and whatever. Well, as I said, we haven't seen oranges since 1939. And the cook's own said, uh, come and help yourselves to the duff lads, he says, in this great big cauldron of fresh orange segments. So up we went and we spooned it in, you see, and covered it with the evaporated milk and guts it down. Second helpers, come and help yourself, there's plenty more, you know. <laughs> Well, we got our own segments every day for a week, and at the end of the week, we were cursing. You know, when, when are we going to get something different? <laughs> <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> Spotted dick with them. And, uh, but of course, uh, we used to have a big sack of oranges in the um, company office, and if you want one, you just want to help yourself. Yeah. I mean, they were so cheap. Yeah. And uh, we always used to get a sack all from the local grow, you know, just out of uh, yeah. uh, you know, the kindness of his heart, I suppose, or make sure we didn't get too hard on him for any reason. Uh, but that beautiful grapes and the ice cream was delicious, absolutely mm. delicious. We went into Toby when we were, just after we got there, we were still there to go there. And we went to this ice cream parlour and we sat on these stools along the bench and we had what you call the Knickerbocker Glory, big fluted glass full of various sorts of ice cream and fruit inside. Yeah. Half a crown, which was a lot of money in those days. Oh, but we hadn't seen anything like this, you see, so we ate it all. Lovely. And uh, the proprietor, did you enjoy that, lads? Yes, I'll tell you what he says, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you can eat another one, he says, you can have it for nothing. If you fail to eat it, you've got to pay for it. <laughs> yeah, set him up, no, set him up. We only got about a third of the way down. <laughs> that was it, we couldn't get any more into it. Any more was worth it. We paid him his half, yeah. extra half a crown. I don't suppose you remember the name of the cafe? No, no, no. it's on the, on the Allenby Road in uh, Tel Aviv on the silver front there. Yeah. And, uh, but, I mean, the, the ice cream we had during the war was pretty dreadful stuff. You know, mm. it, was, it was utility and... Uh, yeah, yeah, and um, God knows what was in it. Well, that it, looked, it looked like ice cream, but that was it. Yeah. This, was, this was the real stuff, you know. Mm. And we felt a bit guilty at first because back in England in early 1946, they were still rationed. Mm. And they were still short of everything. Yeah. In Palestine, we had everything in there. You know, sweets, the law, mm. fruit, lovely food, and uh, as I said, if it hadn't been for the trouble, it would have been paradise. Apart from the terrace, <laughs> it was great. Yeah, there's always a catch, isn't there? No. Gosh, yeah. yeah. I've got a question straight up prompt. With respect to the driving, have you talked about the time that you had to drive that sergeant or that officer into town? I think you want to go to church? Oh, yes, yes, they're quite right there. Um, our commanding officer had a friend stationed. He, he was a captain in the Rimi. The Rimi is the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers. Yes. My dad was in Rimi. Hmm? My yeah. dad was Rimi. Oh, right, right. Anyway, and I was a duty driver. And Sunday morning, this is, the, the, the trouble was on, it was well advanced, and the Arabs were up in arms, they were roving the countryside killing Jews at random and uh, generally causing mayhem. And um, the, the orderly sergeant came into my, to my bed and said, you've got to take that officer into Telewinski. I said, you're joking. I said, the place is a battlefield out there. <laughs> he says, oh, no, he said, he's got to go to Mass, the CO, so you've got to take him. I thought, oh, Christ, I got up and uh, got dressed. Got the staff car out. Now I could have been sitting on an escort. I thought I won't be very popular if I get somebody this. So I got this bloke, this officer. He carried me. He never even said good morning. Mm. He sat in the back, and I drove off. Well, I spent 12 miles to Telewinski, and nothing happened until we got to about to within two miles of the camp, and we had to pass through this village called Beit Nabal. And when I get near the village. I can see this mass of Arabs in the road and they've got a barrier of oil drums. And so I slowed down, you see. And as I did so, I got this sten, I had a sten gun in the rack at the side of me, so I took it out of the rack and laid it across my knees, you see. And this officer leant forward, no, 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 he says, don't go anything to, don't go anything to promote them. And he grabbed me by the shoulder, you see. Another, another windy officer, you know, that's what he did. 
So I said, I said, oh, don't worry, I'll take care of it. And we stopped, you see, and um, I wound down the window, and this house surrounded us, banging the top of the car, you know, and uh, pressing their faces against the glass. And, and I had a bit of Arabic in those, uh, Arabic in those days, and I talked to this fellow, I said, what's going on, you know, they're saying, oh, no, no, it's, you know, they just been told that their country had been divided into two, and they were going to get the worst of the bark, and then they were not very happy, not surprisingly. Mm. And uh, I tried to persuade him to move the drum, you see, but he wasn't going to, you know, and they started to rock the car. And this bloody officer had it on my shoulder. <laughs> and uh, eventually, um, I was spotted in the crowd, a young Arab youth who worked in our camp at Telewinski, right a very good lad, spoke perfect English, and he was a sort of a um, go between between the military and the Arab workers. And I called him over, and I managed to, he came over, and I said to him, Surely man, what's going on, you know, he says, well, he says, you know, we're very angry, he says, uh, we're taking our country away, I said, well, we're angry as well, we're, we're simply, you know, you buttoned him up a bit. And we chatted for a while, and eventually he uh, persuaded this um, bloke, this Arab leader, to make me let us go, he said, well, you're right, these are good lads, these are friends of the Arabs. And I took the barrier down and we drove off. And do you know, I can remember everything in detail what happened on that incident, but I cannot for the life of me remember what happened afterwards. We drove out of the village and coming towards us were, were some brain carriers. You know what a brain carrier is? Mm. Track vehicle that carries infantry and they were yeah. keeping down Scottish borders and I recognised the helmets. Whether I, I dropped him, I must have dropped him off at Telewinski, Tel but I can't remember doing so. I cannot remember whether I waited for him to bring him back or what happened. My mind was a complete blank, mm -hmm. an absolute blank, and I can't. I remember the incident in Beit Nevada in detail. I can still see those <laughs> faces pressed against the glass now. <laughs> <laughs> Blaming me, you know, for yeah, yeah. yeah. And this dreadful bloody officer, who was in a blue funk. Man, was in a blue funk. He thought I was going to, he thought I was going to open fire on these uh, Arabs. <laughs> well, it's as well to be ready. Huh? It's as well to be ready. Well, it wasn't that. I didn't want them grab, open the door, grabbing the, the, no. the weapon. You see, no. that, was, that was the uh, that was the main problem. No. And I, I wasn't particularly scared. I didn't think they were going to. No. <coughs> they, were, they made a lot of noise, you know, full of sound and fury. And yeah, that was the problem, wasn't it? Yeah. It was all sound and fury. Yeah. What was the name of the village again? Beit Nabala. B-E-I-T-N-A-B-A-L-A. Beit Nabala. -E Beit Nabala. Oh, right. mm. yeah. That was about two miles from the Telewinski camp. Yeah. And a lot of our Arab workers in that Telewinski came from that village. They lived there and uh, came to work in the camp. Yeah. So, as well as being kicked out of the country, we also deprived all these Arabs of work, you see. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 I think that's the end of that tape. I'll just change it.